the cross has come to bow, and now for him have laid him down. The battle lines were made and drawn in the heavenlies long ago. When Satan said. Oh
and things that we are going through, the prayer request. God, when we say, let's lay them aside, let's lay them at your feet. And Lord, that you may bear them and lift us up and encourage us. And God, let us love each other. Let us love each other with all of our hearts and just let us have a heart that is desiring to reach the lost, to share your gospel. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for those who are gathered here today. And God, I pray that every heart is just on fire with a desire to serve you. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. 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 Y'all may be seated. In Isaiah chapter 60, we read, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And that passage of scripture, uh, we're looking at a nation that is just getting ready to, they're on the brink, they're going into uh, exile, and they're going to be there for 70 years. And Isaiah and Jeremiah both are, are working with it working with both nations, and they're telling them, hey, this is happening. And, and there came a point where there was a call for repentance earlier, but there came a point where there was the understanding that even now, even if you repent, then you should, but because of everything else, you're still going to go into this exile. You're still going to suffer this wrath that you are so justly deserving. And when he says this in Isaiah chapter 60, arise and shine, for your light has come, he was prophesying a thing that is has multiple prophecies attached to it. First of all, to them, it was that one day God would not leave them in that place of exile, but he would deliver them out of there. And then it was also a showing of the reminder that one day God would himself would come to earth in the form of man, Emmanuel, right? And that would be their light. And this, this same promise extends to us even today. We can arise. It means get up and get going. And we can shine because we have the light of Christ in us. And I love what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you will not shine, then there is no light. And there's this concept here, and I'm kind of paraphrasing that, but we are the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. And he, he talks about if you are the light of the world. So if you were to take that concept, if you are the light of the world, that means that without you, without the light of Christ coming through us as his children, as Christians, as his church, there is no light. And so this song is called Darkness into Light. And this concept is, Lord, let us see your blessings and let us, let us just know that you're constantly working in an amazing way for us, on us. <laughs>
thought. It is so easy to get caught into darkness, isn't it? You know what I mean by that? It's kind of a little, it's a little deep, I know. <laughs> but it's so easy to get caught and get wrapped up into darkness. It's so easy to find ourselves in kind of a dark place, as we might say. And uh, it's one of those things that is just absolutely rampant today is, is we talk about depression. And I brought this message, uh, partial of this message in this form, to church last week in Kansas City. And afterwards, one of the ladies came to me and just said she appreciated it so much because it's something that is not talked about very often. And that is depression. It's something that we struggle with. And there's commercials about it on TV, and there's medications, and uh, there's evidence of it all over the place. And we often would think that Christians would not struggle with that. We would say, well, we have the joy of Christ. And we talked about don't let anyone rob us, right? We, talked, we even made that correlation with joy and how that if we're not careful, Satan would desire to take that joy from us. And he does very well at it. We, we oftentimes will put our guard down and, and we'll let him rob us of our joy of Christ. And, and, you know, we think about that and we don't talk about it, especially in our churches, because we're afraid of how that might relate. You know, so, oh man, if someone thinks I have no joy, well, they may think I'm lost or they may think that, you know, I'm not right with the Lord and things like that. But, and, and maybe some of that is true. But if we were to compare it on a biblical scale, you know, the loss of joy and even the slumping into <clears throat> any type of depression is something that we see throughout Scripture. Think about David, right? Lord, restore to me, what? The joy of my salvation. This is a man after God's own heart. This is a man who is accredited with writing more scripture through psalm than anyone else throughout the word of God. This is a man that saw the greatest victories that are, are still talked about today and that parallels are made, not even in our churches, but outside about killing giants and things of that nature. God used and worked with David in an amazing way, and still we see him praying and singing, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And I shared with you at the very beginning of the, me of the service that my heart is toward our pastors, and it's so neat that we have two pastors here today, and two pastors' wives, and um, really, really three pastors' wives, and so very thankful for my wife, and, um, but what we often overlook is that even in ministry, you know, a pastor should never determine his calling on a Monday. We just don't do that, do we? We, we, we you think of, you don't do it on a Monday. You know, you think you get later in the week and you see what God is doing. <clears throat> but it's rampant. And it happens so easily, especially in this world. And like that song that I just sang, Lord, just let us see your blessings. Don't let me be so overwhelmed with the hardships of this world, with the, with the mail that I'm getting or with the, the phone calls or with uh, you know, the things that are happening, the, the sicknesses and everything else. Don't let me get so overwhelmed with that that I forget that I am just a pilgrim in this land and I'm journeying to get through here to get to glory where all those things will be done and gone and in our past. That's an exciting day. But until then, right? Until then. We must move through this world. Well, let me just say that 1 Kings, and, and you don't have to turn here, but in just a moment I'm going to have you turn to 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Kings we read a story about Elijah and how that Elijah had experienced just an amazing victory in conquering the prophets of Baal, if you all remember that story. And how that the prophets of Baal were unable to call down fire from their God. But Elijah, through just a prayer, was able to not only call down fire, but to was able to look up all of the water and to just put to death, and ultimately put to death the prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel was so frustrated with this, she said, you know what, I'm going to have his head. And, and Elijah, in all of the victory that he experienced, became afraid. Think about that. All of the victory he had experienced, Elijah became afraid. A man who could pray and say, God, just send down fire and, and then send the rain. And God answered his prayer. He was so afraid to just say, Lord, deliver me from this crazy woman. You know, <laughs> He couldn't do that. He could call down fire from heaven, but he couldn't say, Lord, deliver me. And what's he do? He takes off and he finds shelter under a juniper tree. And in that place, we find that God does not condemn him. You notice that? He doesn't condemn him. And this is all in 1 Kings chapter 19. He doesn't condemn him there, but 
he allows him some time to rest, to be there, to stay in that place, to regain his composure. And not only does he say, be here and rest, but he says, you know what, I'm going to take care of you. And Elijah opens his eyes and he saw that God had provided cakes for him and, and everything he needed to sustain him. But there came a time when he had to get up. There came a time, and it, this is the actual phrasing in, in verse, uh, verse 9. He says to Elijah, what doest thou here? Okay, Elijah, you've had some time to think about this. You've had some time to process it, to get some rest. I've provided for you. I've met all of your needs. Now, what are you doing here? Why are you still here? Not that you're here, but why are you still here? Why have you not moved forward? There is much to do out there. God met him where he was, met his needs, and then said what? Get up and get back to it. Friends, the ultimate answer to our struggles and our joy and any struggles with our depression and things today, whether we experience it personally, we know someone who's experiencing it, or we see it in our churches, or we see it in our community, the ultimate answer is not found in our drug stores, it's not found, found in liquor stores, it's not found in any, in any place that is ungodly, it is not found even in the radio stations or anything like that. It is found in one place and one place alone, and that is through Jesus Christ and through his word and through his Holy Spirit just sustaining us, meeting us where we are, and then are allowing him to lead us and get up and go do what he's called us to do. Now, here's where I want you to be. If you open your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're just going to read a couple short verses. Let's think about this God for a minute. This God who rained down this fire. This God who was victorious. This God who met Elijah where he was and then sustained him. Just think about who he is for just a moment. Now fast forward in time a little bit and look here in 2 Corinthians when Paul is defending himself. Think about that too. Paul is defending himself and his apostleship. And he is speaking to this church that is saying, no, no, you're not who you say you are, or you're not of uh, the elevation you think you are. And Paul is about to defend himself, but with grace he pours himself out in this letter, and he says, let me love on you a little bit first. I know you are still enduring persecution because that was the early church, just the life of the early church. Many of you have already been just set us apart from your families, and you don't even have a family anymore. You've been cast out. But let me in grace just tell you this one thing about God. He says, blessed, verse 3, blessed be God. Give him a blessing, because even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God <coughs> of all comfort. Guys, if you don't have that line under underlined, if you don't have a pencil mark under that, a highlight through that or something, then you need to. You need to. It needs to be a, a line, a characteristic of God here, that every time you flip through your pages and you see that highlight, you, you are reminded of this characteristic of God, that he is the God of all comfort. His defining characteristic is love, but let's not forget that in that love, he is the God of all comfort. There is no true comfort that comes from anything other than God because he is the God of all comfort. He's the one who gives that. And then Paul goes on in verse 4 and he says, Who, this God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulations. There is not, friends, there is not a single tribulation. There is not a thing that you go through that God is not aware. And Psalm 139 reminds us of that, doesn't it? He knows our thoughts. He knows our goings and our comings. He hears our words long before they ever spoke. He knows us in Jeremiah. He knew us while we were still in the womb. He has known us from the beginning, from eternity to eternity, because God is eternal, and he sees over our timeline. He knows you, everything about you, and there is not a tribulation that my God of all comfort cannot comfort. And then that's that, that second part of verse 4, that we may be able. Whoa! Do you see what just happened there? Paul is talking about the God of all comfort, describing him. But then he says... This beautiful blessing does not come without some responsibility. That we, we, Paul, we, the church at Corinth, we, the church here in Helena, <coughs> we, believers today, 
who <coughs> may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. We become extensions, not only of the grace of God and the love of God and salvation through Jesus Christ, but we become the workmanship that God uses to extend himself and show his characteristics to the world today, loving one another, as we just sang here just a moment ago, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Friends, you're going to have to at some point ask yourself, in your walk with Christ and in your position here at your church, wherever you serve, are you an empty vessel or are you a spring that provides? Are you something that is just consistently needing to be poured into? Pour, 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 and you just absorb, absorb, absorb. Or are you going to return that and be a spring of comfort? Are you going to take the same comfort that God has poured into you and say, let me tell you what my God has done. Let me tell you how big my God is. Because my God is bigger than your giants. He's bigger than your darkness. He's brighter than all of that. He takes your darkness and he turns it into light. This next song, I wrote as I was feeling like God was wrapping up my ministry as a pastor, which was not something I really wanted. I felt like my heart was still, in my mind, my heart was still there. But I could tell God was moving me, and I was experiencing some things, and I had sunk into a type of a depression. And I got to a point where, you know, there was only one place I wanted to be, and that was really just kind of laying around. You know, I, didn't, I just didn't want to do anything and I was struggling with that quite a bit and I'm so thankful for my wife and so who saw that and, and just said you know what you need to you need to do something about this and you need to go out and we've you know a lot of prayer went into this whole situation and everything but the song talks about that it's where it came from that even in that darkness because of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit living within me as a child of his. There was something that even in that darkness, something pouring out of me, it was praises to God that could not be contained. And so this song, I hope you enjoy that. <clears throat>
stand up with me.